get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a peach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, and many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. And today, I'm very excited. We have Laura Fuentes. She's founder of MamaBulls.com and the food and lifestyle brand, LauraFuentes.com, where she works with big brands that hire her like Sabra Hummus, Nestle, Bob Redmill, many more. They reach over 700,000 unique visitors per month, and Mama Bulls helps parents feed their children great tasting, healthy foods. And the most important part, Laura, is without spending eternity in the kitchen or breaking the bank, and they provide weekly recipe plans, cookbooks. I love the title of this one, The Best Homemade Kids Snacks on the Planet, and there's two others. And they even partner with a done-for-you meal delivery service to make it ultra easy, and she does this all with you know while raising three kids laura thanks for joining me i'm super excited to be here jeremy yeah so i always like to include a fun fact that most people don't know and we were talking before and you said like i don't know if you know this but i like you're busy enough with the business and the kids but you homeschool your kids yes so tell me about the decision that's that's not an easy decision no, so our kids are 10 almost nine and four and a half and uh it, last year was our first school year homeschooling, that 2015-16 school year. Yeah. And essentially, I just wanted the flexibility to take my kids anywhere I went through my business opportunities and family travel on my own time schedule as opposed to having to cram that in during summer vacation or holidays uh, yeah. when everybody else is traveling. And... I'm, as you can imagine, because of the nature of my work, which is it's really focused a lot of it on back to school, the summertime is, has really been historically like my busiest time of the year. So for me to go on vacation during the summer, it's nearly impossible. Why is it the busiest time? So um, back to, so in the summer, as you know, in business, like we focus on creating products and really gearing up campaigns. And that's not like the week before back to school. I mean, we start working in June. You're gearing up for the back to school rush. Right. Just like retailers gear up for Christmas beginning in September or earlier. We really start in May and June. And I just found it really difficult to fit it all in. And so... um, I basically decided that I wanted to be able to take my kids to Spain for a month in September, um, go to Utah skiing with my boys for 10 days and not be worried about uh, taking uh, homework with us or also um, having to account for our missed days to the school district. So we just made a decision that I would, you know, we have like structured programs and things that I followed for homeschooling. They go to tutoring centers. Right. They are very active in like social activities, yeah. but all of that requires a lot of floor planning. And so um, we just we and, and it's it worked out great. I asked my children repeatedly if they wanted to go back to regular school, and they said no. So I think that's a good sign. You mean you gave them? <laughs> they're like, no, I want to go to a month in Spain, Mom. I, I don't want to go back to school. I mean, I basically told them if you want to go back to regular school, that's fine. But right. you know, there's only give so many days you can miss, and yeah. if we are going on a trip, you're going to have to stay with the grandparents or not come along. And they really weren't into that part. Yeah. And so I think they really realized the benefits of having a flexible schedule and the ability to have um, time to really figure out what they really like to do as opposed to being rushed through school, homework, after school activities. I think any parent listening can really relate to that yeah. after school rush. And then I was just tired of giving the best of their time and focus to someone else. Yeah. You know? So, um, so far, so good. Laura, what do you think's impacted them the most of you? You run this business from home and they see a lot of what you do in the business. What do you hear from them of what's impacted them of how they see you run the business? So I think if you ask my 10 year old, because she's much more, she's a girl. So number one, she's a little bit more mature than her, her brother. Um, <laughs> like she's a little smarter, a little more mature. Yeah, and, you know, no, just, just boys kidding. take a little longer. Right, right. Uh, but you know, this is a real deal. Like 
uh, now she realizes like we have we'll talk about video production and so yeah. I invite my children I never pressure them but I always say like hey these are the recipes we're cooking on video day if you'd like to be in one of the videos let me know um, and they do from time to time they're you know optional but once they've seen how like this all happens they realize that this is for real like this is real business this isn't mom like this isn't I don't even know that they understand what like blogging for fun might be but this isn't like you know a hobby this is what's really supporting our family right um, now that dad's on board like they understand like okay this is like serious stuff yeah you know we just had a photo shoot uh, two days ago and at night you know which is not the best time to take at 6 30 o'clock a four-year-old to take photos but that's you know <laughs> right. the only time we they start could, crying very quickly right? oh yeah you got a 20 minute span to take photos and um, you know and I told they didn't want to do it and, I, and dad just basically stepped in and say hey this is for our job this is what we have to do as a family and so right. everybody got dressed and did it so they're understanding that this isn't just about like right. something that mom's doing like this is really a full family affair yeah. yeah so with the homeschooling what what did you find there's a lot of advantages what were the disadvantages that didn't quite hold you back for doing it but that you were thinking about so I never knew how much time there is to fill like uh, number one, how efficient like teaching a subject at home can be. So, for example, like the same thing that um, my friends' kids might learn in one or two weeks, it literally takes us maybe maybe an hour, like to truly teach the concept. Yeah, yeah. And um, so that leaves you with a lot of time I to see. fill during so the day. So it's more it's more efficient. You feel it's and super so efficient. Then you have to. Fill more to time. find activities and things for your kids to do. So my kids aren't mm -hmm. really actively learning for you know between nine a.m. and two thirty p.m. They're actively learning between nine and eleven thirty or nine to one, depending mm -hmm. on the day. And then what? So then, I mean, you don't want them hanging out at home playing Minecraft on the computer. Right. So you really have to find creative outlets for them, uh, ways for them to learn new skills. Like my daughter picked up video editing uh, this year. Uh, and now she just got a camera, so now she's gonna learn how to. You're gonna hire her. I, I mean, her she's gonna put my my video crew out of a job soon. <laughs> but you know, she's interested, and so yeah. what I found is that it's it's a great opportunity for them to find the things that they like to do, um, and do more of that. Yeah, yeah. You know, the four year old doesn't really count, but you know. So uh, tell me about you know three kids work now homeschooling. I had a big question, which is what does your daily schedule look like? And we were talking about you're very regimented, right? Yeah. So what does that look like? What time do you wake up? Tell me about what your schedule looks like. You're <laughs> so most people think I'm a little insane, um, but I I recently started. I say recently in the last nine months, I figured out that it, it there is such a thing as. I'm not a morning person, but becoming a morning person hmm. um, because that's really the only way to fit it in. So I okay. typically, I say typically it's probably three to four days a week. So that's, you know, on a regular schedule uh, during the work week, I get up around 4.30, 4.45. I'm at the gym by 5 or 5.15, depending on the day. I'm back home by 6.40. And then Monday mornings between 6.40 and 7.45 when everyone's sleeping, during school year, that's when I would take that hour to lesson plan for the week. And I go, it doesn't take that long. So, um, lesson plan, you mean the weekly recipe plan, right? No, the, the le less school lesson the plan. The school lesson plan. Monday oh mornings. my gosh. Man. Yeah, yeah. So, my kids have an, a weekly agenda. So, I basically write down what they have to do. Right. Um, I don't really put like 9 to 10 a.m., I, I just say the subject, what they have to do. And so, they're free to. I, I really they're free to work on their own time yeah. and get that's just basically this is what you have to get done so um, they really they roll around the kitchen around 745 or so so um, at that time there's breakfast all of that and then I leave the house by 830 most mornings I just uh, now I now have a office outside the home yeah. this year um, to make it more efficient for me to yeah. work you're not getting um, distractions yeah, which is actually was a game changer because when I used to work from home or have the office upstairs, um, my kids were coming. They were just excited to have me around and there was very um, 
the structure was lacking in yeah. all for all of us. Yeah. So they knew you were there, so that you're they accessible. knew I was there. Yeah. yeah, and so I couldn't focus on work, and that also made me never stop working. So now, literally, when I get home at four, I I'm done. Like I don't even. Some days I leave my laptop at the office. I don't bring it home. I no longer work from home after four o'clock. It's been a big game changer. So what made you make that decision? Because I think you started Mambo's in 2011. Or yes. So? so this is like you know, you know, five years in that you get your own office. What made you decide to make the change? So I realized that I needed to change. You know, I can't control my kids wanting to have me around. So I needed to be more, it, it made me be more structured with my time as yeah. well in the office. I, we have like 15 calendars, different colors going. I know exactly what I need to get done every day. Um, and then it also taught my kids to, when, when I'm not there, they they also have things to do, and so when I get home, we cook, we go places, we do the afternoon stuff like most parents. Right. But um, during the day, they also have their own focus time and things they have to get done. Yeah. Now the summer is totally, you know, I'm, like it, it's a free for all. Like my care, my kids go to the pool, my in laws, my parents. Every day is different. Right. So uh, the constant thing is that I leave the house um, every day, and then clearly we have somebody that at some point. Yeah, that steps in. My husband um, is now with us, so we will have a very different um, fall schedule where he has certain days that he'll oversee uh, homeschool, and as opposed to, and then they'll go to homeschool center. But on a typical day, literally, I get to the office between eight thirty and nine, and I leave by four, and then I just work on meal plans, I work on deadlines, I work on content. Um, email is the death of most of us; uh, it's so super time consuming. Um, schedule out social media, talk with my team, and then when I leave, I yeah. get to be mom. There was a point, though, you were working late in the evenings, right? Oh, Tell me about yeah. one of those times. So It wasn't always this schedule, No, no, right? no, no. no. Yeah. It wasn't always like this, actually. It used to be that I literally, um, after dinner, um, my husband, cleanup would happen, and around 7.30 at night, I would go upstairs to the office, which is located like kind of like above our garage, to fully finished office, and uh, I would work between seven thirty and eleven thirty, yeah. midnight, what, whatever. I mean, whatever it took, you know, right. every single day. Um, what were you most, working on at those, those so hours? So recipe development, yeah. meal planning, writing out. So a lot of the recipes get tested. It's just the food that I feed my family. I live on right. post-its. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, post-its. Um, notes on my phone, photos on my iPhone, and then I, I some, somehow you have to transfer all of that into paper. Um, so a lot of the times I'm writing blog posts, I'm writing, I contribute to numerous places, um, magazine articles, print magazines, media pitches, I mean literally uh, website design, like there isn't anything that I don't know how to do in my business. I think this is like most entrepreneurs when you, right. you have to do everything. Yeah. You learn you start by yourself, you do everything, you learn how to do everything and then as you grow you start to delegate. Um, so I mean I worked until really late at night for the last uh, up until probably this sep past like yesterday. Past yeah, a no, few just... months ago, you know. But like my yeah. kids were gone all of last week and I I was in the office 12 hour days. If my children are not around and I and my husband's also working on a project like I work 12 14 hour days and and all weekend if they're not around like I'm I do find time for myself but I mostly I yeah. work when my kids are not around yeah what's in the pipeline like how do you decide you know because you said the summertime is you got to do creation right yeah so what what are you working on now that you can talk about uh, so currently uh, this is my first summer that I'm not writing a cookbook because the last three summers I've mm. spent writing cookbooks. What's and been the most popular one? I mean, I read the best homemade kid snacks on the planet, but you have the lunches, right, your best yeah. lunches on the planet. What's the other one? My third one just came out two weeks oh. ago. It's the best homemade, uh, the best grain-free family meals on the oh. planet. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. it really addresses it's food like allergies. The paleo people and the food allergies and yes, all that it's stuff, a paleo yeah. book without calling it paleo because I didn't want to corner it. It's a gluten-free book without just saying gluten-free, so it's not so fad. It's right. really you know protein, vegetables, nothing. You know, nothing out of a box, basically. Um, to tell you the truth, I just base, I just put my favorite recipes into these cookbooks, and then yeah. I keep them on my kitchen counter. Um, right, it's a way so for you to organize them. If other people buy them, what's been the most popular one so far? The, definitely the lunches one. The I lunches mean, it is, one. 
yeah, it's um, I'm very fortunate that all of my books, you know, I've already met my minimum and I've earned royal. I started to earn royalties, um, which if you ask any book author, that's very difficult to do. Yeah, yeah. Um, but fortunately, I what I did first is build a platform and then develop exactly. books to sell it to and continuously promote it. So. Yeah, yeah. The lunch is definitely, I think it's one of those evergreen books that's something parents really struggle with. For sure. And so that. What's the favorite recipe in the lunch or top in the lunch book and the snack book? What do you get the best feedback from that people just love it? Oh my gosh. The lunch is one. (sighs) Or it could be a personal favorite. Okay. I'm just curious, what what surprised you? Like a recipe you put out there that has just been really popular that you may not have expected? So one of my favorite ones in the lunch book has to be, uh, it's really, it, it's not really applicable to lunches. But do you have a copy handy? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I have, um, so I don't have a snack, I, but I do have a lunches book. Okay. Someone told me, I, was, I forgot who I was interviewing, they said if you show the book, then it increases sales of the book instead of just talking about a buy. I forgot what percentage they said. So when I have uh, authors on, I make sure they show the book so that people can yeah. see. Yeah. So um, yeah. So what I love about the it's London a big book, book. Yeah, it's super. Yeah. It's thick. Yeah. I actually, you know, as somebody that owns a lot of cookbooks, I was very. I I really love the texture and how this feels. Like at my counter, like the pages were really thick. I didn't want something glossy or flimsy. Like right, it could. Rip I told the publisher, easily. I'm like. I want people to be able to make like tomato sauce and get on the page and wipe it off and be good to go, you know? Um, But I think this was my first book and one of my favorite recipes is one of my neighbors, when I first moved into my neighborhood 10 years ago, she shared um, her meatball recipe. This is New Orleans or? I I live outside of New Orleans and she's from New York and she shared her... um, homemade meatballs recipe and which is one that we make like almost every other week at our house and um, so I have it in there right and I of course like people don't think of taking meatballs to school um, but I sh- what I love about this book is that I show you exactly how to package any food right, to right. go yeah so um, I think the recipe introductions every recipe has an introduction or a little short story so that's really my favorite part about my cookbooks Mm -hmm. it's the little tidbits that you get to learn about me as a person and where the it's not just a recipe that I made up there's a story behind each recipe exactly yeah that's Um, cool yeah you don't see that and I love that my kids are in them you know my when I first took the photos for that book it was four years ago so my four year old was like six and a half months and now in this third book he's like older and it's just really cool, you know, to just see your family in something tangible. So why no, why no cookbook this summer? So I'm not cookbook because I'm. Uh, oh, you so, just released it. You just released. So it. I just released this third right. one. Okay. This is the grain free family. The grain free family meals. Yeah. Yeah, and um, cookbooks are extremely time consuming. They're really eighteen months in the making, yeah. and so um, they have really tight deadlines. Yeah. And honestly, like, I mean, this is a sort of a business podcast like I can make what I get paid for a cookbook in a, in a week if I if I just do it so right. it's not a financial plus yeah. it's um it was for me it was more of a resume resume builder yeah. um and since I didn't go to cookie school I taught myself how to cook in the last 10 years and that's I think how Rachel Ray started right I mean she wasn't she wasn't a formal trained cook was she I don't know I should oh, look her up yeah yeah but I mean, you know, it's not that hard to make, to learn kitchen skills yeah. uh, and really get into it. And then, which is funny because I didn't learn how to cook until, I mean, I knew how to cook. I just didn't really know about food as much until after I became a parent, which I think right. it's, most people can relate to that. And then I figured out, my gosh, I'm actually really good at this, you know? And um and then just one thing led to the other of creating this company based on food yeah. and how to feed your family. Yeah. What works you know? best for selling the cookbooks for you? You know, showing people the pictures, creating blog posts, uh, and emailing my list about about it consistently. Like, yeah. you have to, I think people often have, um, I know this happens with a lot of people, you have a new cookbook or a new book out, and you do your initial blast, right. and then you sort of like forget about it. Exactly. Um, I treat my cookbooks as another product, something else. I mean, I honestly have put so much time, more yeah. time in a cookbook than any of the other products that we have out there. So right. 
it should be something that's continuously promoted in order to continue to be successful. Yeah. I mean, you probably use that in the weekly plans too, right? Some of people, our, so the, yeah. you have a subscription. Talk about that. When did you first decide to create the subscription? People subscribe and they can get uh, like just uh, the weekly recipes that they can actually you know prepare for their kids, right? Yeah. So in fall of 2012 is when I launched my the first really paid um, subscription paid service. And um, so were you scared at the time? Like because at that point it was all free content, right? Sometimes people when they yeah. put out some paid, they're a little bit worried. What was your thought process? And I know you're an MBA, and you you know you have your business degree, so you're probably like, I want to I want to start charging from the get go. But well, you know, I just felt like there were other meal planning companies out there at the time in 2012, and nobody was really targeting the uh, emotional as well as the issues that as parent like the time management issue and how the psychological thing of feeding your family is really difficult because um, if there's one thing about making a meal for two or making family meals. Everybody focuses on that. But at the end of the day, if you spend 30, 45 minutes cooking dinner and then you bring it to the table and then your kids give you the, like, I don't want it. Like, it just becomes right, yeah. a force, something to fight every single day. Sure. Um, you take that personally. It's almost like going out every single day and someone telling you, like, you don't look great today, you know, or as opposed to like nobody, it's it's the opposite of complimenting. And then eventually right. what's happening is that moms take it personally and they're like, man, I, what I'm making, my family doesn't like. So they, it's sort of a cycle, like they stop trying or my kids won't eat what I make. Or right. they're making and multiple they just meals. make the same thing over and over that may not be the healthiest because their kids will eat it and they don't want to have that fight type of thing. Not only that, but it's just really not teaching your family to learn to learn to love new things. Yeah. You know, I there's stuff I don't like to eat, you know, but I still eat it. And to be quite frankly, most people don't know, but I just, just learned to really like broccoli like a year ago. That's funny. I mean, so there's how- a video with you, tra- I think, talking with one of your kids about eating broccoli. I remember. Uh, it's like the yeah, dinosaurs sure. used to eat this. Or oh, something. that was my son. Yes, yeah, so exactly. Kale. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I, not my favorite. Kale's just not my favorite because of the texture of it, but... So if it's not my favorite and I don't make it as often, it's kind of yeah. hard for me to expect my children to love it. Yeah. And so that's sort of the psychology behind making meals for our families. What happens is that we often, we vary our meals, but we're really only using the same 20 ingredients all the time. Yeah. yeah. And so what I try to do is show families how you can still make your favorites, but let me help you come up with new ways of reinventing the things that may not be as as loved in your family yeah. you know typically it's all the vegetables and sometimes proteins and such but um and then, I, and then that's how i just discovered i was like wow i'm kind of good at making up new things and they actually taste okay you know so what point did you decide to charge your audience right off the get-go so this is right 2012 the mm-hmm. because i knew that there were other companies out there charging for meal plans yeah. and uh and at the time when i first launched i only offered uh a school lunch plan. So I decided to start in tackling the I, the issue of I don't know what to make and pack inside of a school lunch box because that's what I was going through at the time. My daughter was six and my young my other son was five, yeah, yeah. and I was very familiar. And I basically I would put things on a thermos, pack them in a lunch box. You know, there's always the worry of like, is it going to get mushy? All these things. So um, I started with school lunch. And eventually moved on to family dinners. And now our new website uh, for mamables.com will launch next Monday. Oh, it's new. So, okay. Yeah. it's. I, I mean, the website's always up. Yeah. But we yeah. have new plans, new products, right. new yeah. all, all kinds of things in the pipeline. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Beautiful design, though. At what point? Because you had a, a site previous to Mamables, right, where you started blogging. So my personal website, laurafuentes.com, I, blog, I, I was blogging blogging back in 2009, 2010. Yeah. Because I, I'm from Spain. My mom and my friends at the time were in California because when I came from Spain, I lived in California. I went to undergrad in California. And then I moved to New Orleans for graduate school where I met my husband. He's from here. So um, after I had kids, like most people, this is back in 2010 before iPhones. Remember our phones used to take like 1.2 megapixels, right? right? They flipped up and you were like, ooh, the picture was super tiny. And I was, you couldn't send a picture from your phone. So a friend of mine said, well, instead of like 
transferring the picture onto your computer, which was an ordeal, and then emailing it out to your family and different email for everybody, she said, why don't you start a blog? It's basically like an email, but it's the same thing for everybody. And then you can just email them the link to the web page. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's like so much more efficient. <laughs> and right. that's how I started blogging about what my family did. It's sort of like a way to share our week, once a week, what we did with my friends and family back home. Um, but every time I share something about food, and this is before Pinterest and Facebook, so I know it's really hard to understand if you're right. listening, you're going like, what? But this like is Instagram, like Facebook, before right, any right, of this, right, right. right? I mean, Facebook was still pretty new at the time in 2010 for most of us. And um, basically, every time I started things, I started sharing recipes or f- ways of doing food things. People shared that, you know. Mm. So that's how I knew I was onto something. Yeah. So did you? How um, long did you live in Spain until you moved to the U.S.? So I was born and raised in Spain. I came yeah. here in my teens. I didn't speak a lick of English. It's something oh, else people don't impressive. know about me. Yeah. And um, and then I've been here since I've been here since 1991. Yeah. So now that you've been living here, you know, decades, what what was it like living in Spain compared to U.S.? It's life is a little slower. It's very similar to New Orleans, actually. Really. Um. Yeah. You know, things get done whenever. It's yeah. Um, although I, I was, I'm from Madrid, so I'm a big city girl. I, I like the busyness of a big city and I live in the, I currently reside in the opposite of that. I live, if you look at my Twitter profile, it says Southern suburbia, like seriously, it's the suburbs. I drive a minivan. I mean, I'm like those moms, suburb moms. Um, but I do go to New York for work a lot and that's where I kind of recharge and, um, get, you know, meet, do my meetings and stuff. So Laura, what did you want to be when you grew up, when you were living in Spain? You know what's funny is that my mom at the time was one of the few women that was a working mom yeah. in our social circle. Really? Yeah. Um, my dad was a very well-known lawyer. My His mother was in the um, – she worked for the State Department. So – and my mom was a working – she wasn't just like the uh, status wife. She was, she was a working mom. And I just loved it. I what loved did she do? Her. She was in, uh, a director of human resources for a oh. multinational company. Yeah. And I just loved seeing how she wore suits and heels and she just put on makeup. I just, I love the attention that she paid to herself to look her best and go to yeah. work. And so when I, I still tell people all the time that, when, you know, we all go through the, I want to be a teacher and this, but what I really, the image that I always had since I was little is I want to be a working mom and I want to wear yeah. heels and great suits like my mom. Mm. Yeah. Because you could tell from your background, you know, global economics and MBA that you always wanted to do business, obviously. Um, yeah. Yeah, I want to talk about the team and the team it takes to run Mambles, but I still, I want to talk about the lifestyle brand because that, that was interesting too because it's not like you're just running one company with Mambles. You're running the lifestyle food brand with LaraFuentes.com. So tell me about, because you've landed some really big companies. As clients, um, yeah. what's been the most rewarding client? You, I mean, we mentioned Sabra Hummus. We mentioned Nestle, Bob's Red Mill. Tell me one of the – how did you get one of them? What happened? Um, well, there isn't really one in particular that I have love working. You know, every campaign that I work on is really different. Yeah. I love when something kind of pushes my creative limits um, or, and, yeah. no, and I teach myself how to do something new. Um especially video. It's been a huge learning curve for me. Um, what I, The way they found me, basically, is I started blogging out food on my personal website, mm-hmm. laurafuentes.com. And when, I think it's 2013, 2012, 2013, when this whole influencer space really came out yeah. Um, yeah. And, and companies realized that there is such a thing, a thing as this uh, blog, this endorsement of a product through the creation of content, you know, now it's like, psh, totally, right? Like we create content, photos, Pinterest. Right. But back in 2013, it was still relatively new. Companies didn't really have budgets. They didn't have digital teams like they have now. Um, so a lot of it was trial and error working with um, some of my first companies to do that. Um, and so through through those opportunities, I mean, I've had um, I just this year I went for three weeks on the road with one of my clients and I um, did like media and television 
uh, opportunities the entire time um, in Spanish, which was a first for me. Wow. Yeah, so I'm bi fully bilingual yeah. and I can cook on TV. I can, you know, not just cook on video, but um, that was my first experience doing uh, television segments live yeah. in yeah. Spanish, you know, and I and I was a little bit scared and I was like, why? It's, you know, even though it's my first language, it's just because I'd never done it before. Um, right. You're used to doing it all in English, which is interesting. Uh, yeah, and yeah. so uh, and it was great, and I had. And did so you now, reach out to them, or did they find you in that situation? So they find me. They found you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's that's amazing. Yeah. So I they they found me through my content, or um, the PR world is not that. I mean, it's big, but not that big um, in the world of food, and um, and there's not that many influencers that are fully bilingual, and so. I guess you start the narrowing down. The world starts getting really small. It's like, okay, we want a food blogger lifestyle that also speaks Spanish and new targets and this customer. Yeah, yeah, and so um, and so that was great. Um, you know, I think honestly, in the if you ask me what my favorite experience what has been in the last uh, four years or three years, um, that was when I competed on Food Network. Yeah, I saw that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it was like a cheesy wafer or something. What you won the contest, right? Yeah, so it was a competition. You know, like you go in. They it, it was it's a show called Rewrapped with Mark Summers, and you went in, and your whole thing was like you show up, and you don't know if you're gonna make, you know, what you're gonna make cheese waffles or whatever. So, um, you have to basically make a homemade version. How did you get on there in the first place? Um, they found me, so I recreate, all, I, I honestly, I make healthier versions of a lot of things, I right? See. That snack yeah, book yeah. is filled with them. Yeah, yeah, There's yeah. about 50 homemade versions of popular snacks out yeah, there. Okay. Um, and so they found me on Pinterest and then they started looking, the production company found me on Pinterest and started looking into my work, saw that I had a cookbook published and everything else. Yeah. And yeah. they asked me if I'd like to audition. And, um, cool. I had never done a single thing on video. And I was like, but I'm going to do it. And I did. And I showed up. And then I won. And I was like, you know what? I can do it. And I competed against chefs. And I was like, if a mom from home, like if I can win with like this Monte Cristo waffle sandwich, you know, like I can do this. And that's really what inspired me to look into video. Really, I, I just, you know, we all hear videos the next thing. Well, I've been hearing videos the next thing for like two years. And I was like, okay, I can really do it. Yeah. So yeah. that's what propelled all the video. So it's really interesting. And is that video up online? I mean, I only saw the blog post of you know telling the story. Can someone watch that video? Like the the uh, of you winning? Um, I think it's out there. Is you it? know okay. what? It's a good way to uh, for me to revise the post and provide a link for people yeah. to watch it. It's definitely on in Food Network's, yeah. um, what is it called, uh, YouTube channel. But I think you might have to pay like a dollar for yeah. the episode. Yeah. Not sure. Yeah. So talk about the team. Because, yeah. I mean, in the beginning, it's you it's running just, everything, um, yeah. working whatever, 14 hours a day or, you know, crazy hours. Yeah. Um, when did you have your first hire? My first hire was, uh, well, my, I, I would say hire, even though they weren't really paid at the time, they were contributors to the Mama Bowl's website. Hmm. So how so, did that work? Yeah. Yeah. So instead of me. That's better than a hire. Yeah. Right. right? Um, and ex there were other up and coming food bloggers who, um, wanted to grow their blogs as well. Yeah. And I think I might've paid them like at the time, 25 Fifty dollars for a post right. um, because I felt like instead of me creating all this content, I yeah. needed help, and um, that didn't go over as well. It did not. No, because it's really difficult to keep the your tone and someone else to match their tone. Sure. And I, I wanted. I realized that I wanted to be consistent and on brand, and so because I always, I didn't want Mama Bowls to be this logo. I wanted people to connect with the human behind the company. Sure. Yeah. And so um, that, that was really that was my first hire, my first experience. I still take a couple guest contributors yeah. from time to time when people pitch, and it's really great. But for the most part, it's, just it's you. me and yeah, I'm the team that does it. So um, the th the next thing yeah. I hired out, which I it's always what I always 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 suggest to an entrepreneur, is to hire out your social media management. Hmm. 
um, hire and train really well because um, social media management, and I'm not talking about somebody to do your paid Facebook campaigns and all of that. I'm talking about your scheduling, engagement, making sure things are you know brought to your attention because that really is a time suck for yeah. those of us who are in the creation yeah. and uh, revenue generation side. Yeah. So uh, hire out your social media. If something's important, and that doesn't mean that you never have to log in, go in a, once a week, a, a couple times a week, set a timer for 15 minutes, skim right. through it, get a, get a really good impression of what your community wants, but then step out. Yeah. Uh, because you know you, we all know Facebook can be a trap. You can you start watching cat videos. An hour later, later you're looking at someone's pictures that you're like, oh, why gosh, am I doing yeah. this? Yeah. yeah. So I hired that out really quickly, and then as um, more social media channels came out, like um, Instagram and um, Pinterest, um, that person's role and responsibilities yeah. grew. The I do manage my personal Instagram and my personal Twitter and my and Snapchat. So I do manage those myself. I only have one Snapchat, which is my personal one, not my company Normal, Snapchat, yeah. just because it's just too many things. So Laura, what's the most valuable thing you have the social media management person or company do for you? Because I could see, I mean, they could do a million different things. So where do you have them focus that makes the biggest difference? Uh, on social media, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I don't know. What do they do that's... That you find valuable because they could be like, okay, I'm just going to do a post here, or do they respond to the the yeah, audience? Yeah, so responding or... and engagement really is the biggest thing to crack these algorithms. You know, yeah. uh, platforms like Facebook want not only do they want you to post there, but they want to make sure like you're not automating the system all the time. Um, you could just schedule and leave. No, they want you connecting talking to people, right. all of that. So that's really the right. most valuable side. Um, yeah. Basically, you're paying to yeah. engage. Yeah, because I wanted to talk, have you talk about that because, you know, there's all these, you know, Buffer app and all, you know, um, yeah. you know, a lot of different apps out there. They're like, okay, they just schedule it out there. But you're saying... No, we you, do use the, we do use scheduling apps for sure. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Um, but we basically, when a post goes, you know, the 11 o'clock, you know, if, our, if it's something new, a three o'clock post or whatever, I want to make sure that somebody is around that night to answer any questions, go through the engagement, comments, talk back, yeah. um, answer any messages that we get, um, reply on Twitter, um, Instagram comments, you know. So really is that reciprocity that, hey, we're here, we listen. Yeah. Um, oftentimes people just have questions or they're like, oh, where is this recipe? Or, you know, something's photographed. What kind of lunchbox is that? So really to provide them with the resources that they're yeah. looking for. That's interesting that that was your first hire, actually. That, so, absolutely. Yeah. I saw that the time that was sucked out and it's non-productive time, so out. Yeah. I mean, it looks like Facebook. You have a huge Facebook group, I think over 120,000 fans. And then... Pinterest, is Pinterest really big for Momables brand too? Yeah, for both Momables and LauraFuentes.com, Pinterest is huge because it's what I do is always it's so visual, right? Yeah. Um, I spend a lot of time learning photography. We are now have a staff photographer as well because I just can't do it all at the same time, all the time. Um, or sometimes I have to be in a picture. So there's just only, and I've already <laughs> done the whole like setting the camera timer and like running to it. Um, so uh, Pinterest is really big as a traffic traffic referral source. Yeah. Um, I like it's always in my top three. I like to make sure it's not number one. If it's number one, I'm doing something wrong, even yeah. though I have a very visual platform and content um, because I don't want to rely on one thing to support my business for traffic. Right. So I like for Google organic. We work really hard on SEO, yeah. extremely yeah. hard in our blog posts, in our back end side of our yeah, website. That's your top, which is search. Yeah, search yeah. is my top. 40% of my traffic is still um, organic search. And after that is um, always like my social channels and my newsletter. My newsletter communities are around 80,000 families. And so we like to keep it. We, we like our traffic to come from our own, our own yeah, community. For sure. So after social media manager, what was the next? Um, my staff photographer, um, she came next. And then um, I've had a couple stints with virtual assistants. Mm -hmm. um, I say stints. Now you have just, Stephanie. 
So now I have my awesome Stephanie, which you know. Um, she really is much more. She really is like a She's local. Coordinator. She's local, right? She's local. Yeah, so, so how'd you find her? <laughs> so she is, we, we like nepotism around here in the South, you know. She is family. She's uh, oh, okay. my husband's cousin. Okay, yeah. that's the best, yeah. That's the You're best. Like, you can't leave your family. <laughs> <laughs> It was like, man, if you don't work out, it's going to be really tough. Right. To Those Thanksgiving you. dinners, forget about it. Um, but she really does a lot of the coordination. What I, I'm simultaneously managing like 12 different calendars, 10 yeah. projects, contracts at the same time. So she has become crucial for me to keep it's your up second with second brain. Things. Yeah, it's really my right hand to make sure that everything I got to turn in today gets done, that I'm, we, look, we look ahead of what's coming up next week. Um, for on a, we're on a production schedule that we you know are ready for video day on pre-production. So um, so really, um, Stephanie came on fall of last fall, so last September of 2015. Yeah. My other hire is um, she's full time, and then my other full time hire is a director of um, brand partnerships and marketing, and that is strictly for my personal brand that we just spoke about. Yeah. So her her sole job is to seek out opportunities, business opportunities. Okay, that For sounds me. that sounds good. So, what tools do you use to stay organized? Like you said, you and Stephanie, what what do you use for productivity and organization? Any softwares so, or tools you recommend? Yeah, so we we have Basecamp. We Basecamp the heck out of everything. Okay. Um, we now it's a verb. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> it's a verb. It's like, well, let me Google that. Let, can you Basecamp that? Yes. Um, we also use um, Dropbox company wide. So everything is shared via Dropbox with my team. Um, and if you're listening and you use something like Dropbox, please make sure you always have a backup of that running simultaneously. It's super important yeah. um, as a business owner to have a backup of the backup. And I'm uh, we paranoid also, like that too, yeah. Oh, I'm so paranoid. Yeah. It's because you know what? I have. So what do you, I not. use Amazon S3. What do you? Yes. Yeah, okay. Any tool that can back up what you have of your backup, you know? Right. Um, it's one thing to lose your hard drive, another one to lose your cloud. Right. And um, we also use iCalendar company wide, and we have like 15 calendars going shared among different things every base camp. And what I really, what I like about base camp is that I can export that into a different calendar. So I take that off when I'm not working on that project. Um, but really, very simple base camp and iCalendar. Yeah. So I want to talk about, I don't know if I'd venture to say the most important hire, but one of them is your husband. Yeah. Quitting. So talk about that decision. Um, so this it comes is recent. to the point, it's recent. Yeah. He, um, I mean, we've, I, we kind of toyed with the idea, you know, wouldn't it be nice, you know, he is definitely in he, his background. We met, we met in the MBA program. Um, his background is finance and operations. Mm -hmm. What was he and, doing before? Now yeah. helping mama boss. So before he was um, a CFO and COO for a small hospital, yeah. and then last year that small hospital in healthcare. So that they merged to a bigger hospital, and he took on a role as um, strategic operations, mm -hmm. really project management. He is phenomenal with details, yeah. which I despise. Really? Yes. Oh. Uh, I. I in spite of my entire job being solely focused, it seems on, like, like you are very detail oriented. Actually, that's why I'm surprised. I am, but I have a really love hate relationship with it. I got so, you. You don't like um, it, yeah. Yeah. So he and he's very good, very good with all finances. So he manages all the financial aspects, and then he, um, as you know, or every marketer knows that at some point you can't, you really need something more sophisticated to send out create email funnels, lists, yeah. and I was doing it all by myself you know, with something like MailChimp, pretty simple. Yeah. And then in 2015, we went, we switched over to Infusionsoft, yeah. and yeah. we had to have help to do that. You and need that a full-time person to run, run that. Oh my gosh, that was so complicated, and we I have a virtual assistant who handles some of that, and then my husband was working full-time, and then helping me with Infusionsoft as well, and then it just came to the point where I was like, okay, we really need to focus on, we have this huge list and we're not, you know, we're really not utilizing it. And I need someone to just, I can't continuously think about strategic ways to grow in that list, plus create contact, content, work deals. The, you know, I just, I was yeah. like, I can't. Um, so the person, it really happened because the person that I need, I can't really hire out there. Right. 
And so I needed But him. you can't hire a COO, CFO of a hospital, <laughs> but now you yeah. can. And now I can. So um, yeah. this, you know, online marketing is a complete new industry for him. The biggest thing, um, an advantage that we have is that I always kept him in the loop for the last three years. Yeah. So while he didn't know all the details, he kind of understood the workflow and what happens with this and what happens with that. Um, and I think that's been really, really fundamental to the success of um, him entering in and not having to learn everything from scratch or the fact that I didn't go hire somebody with online marketing experience, you know? Um, he's been really learning my the industry and how we've been doing things for the last three years. Yeah. So now he really, he's, we're, we launched a new website on Monday. So by the time this podcast goes live, probably it's already out there. Yeah. Um, but, you know, every opt-in has a different, you know, um, funnel and every, where they come from and where the content. So it's really about you the ability track to track everything, to track everything and maximize the traffic. Like I really wasn't, you know, my, my website in September gets over a million page views and, and visitors because yeah. it's back to school. People really come to it. And honestly, I wasn't maximizing what I was building, right? Um, because I, I, there, there's really only so much I can do, you know, right. uh, by myself. And um, so he's been instrumental in taking that over. And um, I mean, he's he he told somebody the other day, like I'm working harder now than I was at my other jobs. You know, he's like brain. <laughs> You're spent. a slave driver. You're like, all right. <laughs> <laughs> He spent at the end of the day, you know, we, yeah. we, um, I get up really early, but I also go to bed really early. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in bed by nine o'clock now, most nights. Yeah. So. so tell me about the decision though, because that's not yeah. an easy decision. No. So how did you know it was time? So it was time. And, um, I think if you asked him this question, he would say, I saw that it was time when um, my wife started bringing in what I made in a month and a week. And so he just, I, that, he said that phrase to me not too long ago. And right. I think he would tell you that. But it wasn't just one week. It was like consistently. Um, and then we were, able, we, we, we were able to save up. You know, he's super um, methodical and diligent about our finances. Yeah. We don't have any debt so, except of our house. So he was always like, okay. If we're doing this, I, he made sure that he um, he flipped. He, he said yes and quit when we were able to have like a year's worth of expenses saved up in the right. bank because that was the plan. man side. You know, like I want to make sure we're prepared. Right. And, you it's know. true because you always have that backup. You know, if he is he's working. Um, oh, if something happens to the site or whatever happens. Yeah, I mean, just, I didn't earn yeah. any money in the last in the first two years, so him having being our full time provider really allowed for yeah. me to focus in the business and not take any money out, yeah. you know? And then the first year we, I earned some and then the second year more and so forth. And that's when he realized, okay, this is really like serious, yeah. Yeah. you know? You, you know, Laura, I want to talk about that for a second because some people think, oh, they just see what it is now and they see it as an right. overnight success, right? So how long was it before you actually were earning money that you knew this was going to be a business for you? How long was it? So... I, probably 2014, 2015, so, like so just years, last year. Three or four years. Or yeah, years. really three years into it. And yeah. that's the thing. Like most people quit before they're really mm. ahead. Um, and, I, and I realized I was very fortunate because I had my husband providing for us yeah. while I was, you know, focusing my time on growing this thing. But um, – when I, and I, it's like that's why I tell you like the Food Network thing was really pivotal because pivotal because um, not only did I could I do it but there is there is such a thing as like the demand for this type of creativity that's really everyday food right and right. you know I'm 37 I have three kids like you mentioned Rachel Ray earlier she's getting closer to the 50 and so like you know I feel like my generation of moms are different than while yeah. we look up to her. We are jugg we this generation like you know mom's my age we have kids we're juggling school activities and uh, soc soccer and like all of these things and still wanting to make food for our family so I realized that I was not only onto something but I was also relatable yeah and um you live and it. that's really huge to build a community yeah you live it yeah yeah every day I don't drive fancy cars it's like I tell people like there are materials okay in my minivan you know uh, <laughs> the real deal. 
you know, I also want to talk about the content um, side of things because that's huge for you. And I, and I thought it was interesting. So I was looking at watching a lot of the YouTube videos. And I was trying to figure out which one, why are some have 68,000 views. There's some with 68,000, 44,000. And why one of my favorites, which was the Mango Popsicle one, only had like almost 1,000 views, right? Because I would think right. that would be popular. So what separates the Jimmy Dean one was hugely popular with mm-hmm. over 68,000 views. Yeah. And I also look at, okay, you your videos are like one to three minutes or so. So talk about your content creation process because it seems like you have that down and uh, you know do a really good job with that. Thank you. Um, so honestly, like I'm still – I, cr- I find a balance between the things that I want to make, that I want to create, that I want to eat, and what I know my community is searching for. Um, because I'm not, it's just like we just spoke about, because I live it, I know exactly what it's like to cook dinner at this right. time. And You're your own customer. Type I am my own yeah. customer, yeah. And, and I think that is really the best type of like business success is to be a user of your own product so you can continue to innovate and change. And I knew that moms are not gonna watch, like, yeah, we may watch the 30 minute show on Food Network, but when they come to me on YouTube to learn how to cook a meal, I'm not entertainment. It's like a minute, 24 seconds. You know? it, like they wanna learn how to make it because they're on their phone in the kitchen right. with the recipe open, maybe, right. you know? Right. So I realized that my timing for these recipes and videos are, it's short and so I knew that I and I want to be able to say I'm going to teach you how to cook something in yeah. less than three minutes right okay right. Um, if I put together a uh, you know I think one was 45 seconds or something like do the Jimmy oh, Dean the one Jimmy Dean was, was like you set the timer and you're like yeah 45 seconds and like chop chop all right and then <laughs> So that was part of the campaign, the, the requirements, you know, the client came to us and said, hey, I, the, the constraints are 45 seconds, what can you create? And I'm like, oh, 45 Oops. seconds, it's a long time on air, so I can make you like breakfast, you know, breakfast tacos with pineapple salsa. They're like, really? <laughs> so um, with shortcuts, you know, you don't, I'm not going to make salsa from scratch, I'm going to use store-bought salsa. But right. um, the, the content is always a... And under you really have to create great content is you have to have an understanding of what can you answer for your target audience like what is your purpose for that right. unfortunately the mango popsicles or whatever they they didn't do as well but that was right. just one of my I guess kids that's, recipes right and yes, I like that one too yeah I just made it you know um, how to boil an egg a hard boiled egg is like you go on Google if you search how to boil a perfect Please, you know, peel hard egg or whatever the combination is. That's I'm number one on Google, and really? my video is number no one oh, wow. on YouTube, and it's got like 300,000 views. Like, but that is a struggle. Like, if you want to make hard boiled eggs and you don't want them like green or nasty looking, then right. you can find me and I show you exactly how to make it. Um, and that was funny. It was like one of my first videos way back when. Um, is that the so, most popular video that you have out there? I think it's the most popular video and um, and what I say unfortunately, even though it's my most popular video, unfortunately that's not a video that is, that it's highly targeted toward the type of audience that really brings in revenue. Yeah. So as a content creator, I don't just, it's one thing when you create content for traffic and whatnot, but when you start to think about content as a magnet for, or, or a lead magnet. For that type of audience, so that's pre-qualified, right. you know, and pre-filtered. Like sure. I want moms finding me, or right. people that want to cook for themselves, or that would eventually buy one of my products. Then I have to kind of create the type of content that matches that. Yeah. And so, um, how to keep apples from browning in the lunchbox? Yeah, box, that's exactly. That's the one that was forty-four thousand views, which I love. I think you pour like pineapple juice in the container and. In the sliced apples, it's it's great, yeah. Yeah, and so kind of like okay, let me answer some of the questions. You know, while the egg one is awesome, or how to keep how to wash berries, that's great. But those are universal questions that doesn't really attract. You want moms? Yeah. I want I want people who come to will then opt in into my list and everything else. So even though it has less views, there are higher highly targeted views. Yeah. So to me, that's better. 
So talk about what big mistakes have you made with content creation that you thought, oh, this is going to work so well and just crickets did not work. Oh, gosh. Because it's probably the same things that I would think or that anyone would think to do. Yeah. And so I want to learn from what maybe didn't work as well. You know, honestly, normally it's like things are, are passion, something that's passionate, that we're passionate about, but it's slightly off brand. Yeah. Like what? What was that for you? Uh, um, gosh, we've had like muffin recipes that I have no idea why they didn't do well. Um, smoothies, although they're super popular, they haven't done as well. Um, I mean, granted, it's really hard to create something that becomes number one on yeah, search. Yeah. Um, but it, that's I don't. That's why I'm asking you to... because you'll have you know, you test probably a lot of things and a lot of recipes. Yeah, and honestly, a lot of it is um, just sharing the recipe and not the takeaway. Yeah. So not answering like what is really this what's the purpose for this? Okay, some recipes are great. Like one of my um one of the more involved recipes in my I say more involved because it's not a one skillet, one pan kind of recipe. It's the most delicious recipe out there. It's like this um chicken with prunes and sage, right? And I absolutely love that dish and it's delicious hands down, but it's not one that has done really well. Because not a lot of people are searching for that, and most people don't think to pair. It's a little bit, it's a little fancier than my skillet lasagna, right? Right. Yeah. So, um, so really, you just have you're to pulling try. a lot of factors. You're pulling in speed. You're pulling in what you like. You're pulling in what someone's searching for. Yeah. And that's kind of the 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 meld to, you know, creating a popular video. Absolutely. Content. And, you know, just you have to spend as much time as you did thinking about the video in creating, you know, setting it up on the back end yeah. as well. So I didn't know that at the beginning. So now we're like a lot more SEO centric. Yeah. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. yeah. I'm just looking over here because I'm looking at all your videos here on the other screen. And it seems like the pancake ones do really well. Also, yes. the allergy. People friendly. know me for my pancakes. <laughs> yeah. The syrup, homemade strawberry pancake syrup recipe did really well. So how do you get ideas for what, what's next? I mean, do you, do you go to your community? Do you just look online? Is it just what's top of mind for you? Because you have to, I mean, how often are you creating videos? We used to do once a month video production days. We're up to two days a month. So about, um, on average, about 15 videos a month. Yeah. Uh, so I started, when I, first, when I first launched my YouTube channel about really 18 months ago, I started um, creating videos to, what, to, to blog posts that were already popular. Yeah. So I could bank on the popularity of the blog post. So I went to my Google Analytics and I said, show me the top 10 on both laurafuentes.com and mamabolts.com. And then I looked at, okay, how can I create a visual for those? And I started there. And, and that was like probably the first three or four months. And then um, now, and then I started adding uh, videos to, I mean, there's, we have so much content, you know, like Mama Bowls has over 500 recipes and blog posts out there. And my personal uh, website has over 300. So it's almost like, what do you start? Well, you start with the most popular things first. Right, right. And then um, after that, I started um, using, now when I look at my content calendar, not every not every recipe that's going to come out gets a video, but for the most part, a lot of them get video. Mm -hmm. And so I'm much more... And that also helps when I create content and recipes or things that I want to share is it, like, is that going, how is that going to come across video? Some yeah. recipes look great on photo, but the reality is like on video, not so much. Gotcha. Or they're very elaborate or uh, it's going to take more than three minutes for me to explain. Right, and so. right. So Laura, what's a food or meal that parents think is healthy that's really not? Because not only are you producing recipes that taste good, but you focus on healthy recipes as well. What's something you found from creating or researching that is is maybe common that people think is healthy, but you're like, no, this is this is really not that healthy. And so you steer away from it. Well, the word healthy is super relative. So actually right. 
if you really look at if you if if you look at all my positioning and I, I say I really steer away from the word healthy and I say I got you. fresh. I got you. Okay. Um. So I really what I tell people is like I teach parents how to make fresh healthy is a, is a loaded is a loaded word. Yeah. Healthy is a loaded word because if you like I can tell you that I wake up in the morning and I drink bulletproof coffee in the morning for which is like coffee and butter and MCT oil every single morning. And they're like, what? That's Dave like, Asprey would be happy to know that. <laughs> yes, he would be uh, for three years now. So I love it. It's like my drug of choice, coffee. Um, but I, most people are like, would shot like, oh my gosh, how can you be promoting healthy and blah, blah, blah. And you're drinking butter in the morning. You know, well, my blood work is perfect. And, you know, I'm in my best optimal shape in my life. I work out four times a week. I feel great. So the word healthy is really relative. Yeah. So I go... The um, fresh is better, and um, so yeah, I think that people. I, I and with that in mind, I think that when people go to the grocery store, sadly, we're very misguided on what is optimal for our nutrition because mm-hmm. the box mm-hmm. says wholesome, right, whole right, grains, right. simply. Um, the color. I mean, there's a food companies pay a lot of money to um, understand the psychology of a purchase and therefore how to design their packaging. So I think Mm -hmm. it's not so much about the kind one recipe or one meal in particular. Um, The biggest disguise of, in my opinion, towards it's sugar and whole grains. You know, we're our our children, ourselves, we are overly sugared overly whole grained and overly tired and grumpy most of the time and yeah. that is because we are not fed what we should be eat what we should yeah. eat so i'm not in either extreme i my goal is to teach people how to find a balance and feel okay about that right you know yeah i like that that uh distinction with fresh i mean because fresh if it's the fresher it is like if it's not on a box and there's less ingredients it's going to be healthier for you. Right. Are you going to make your pasta from scratch? Probably not. All right. Yeah. That's fine. But can you, what can you add to that pasta meal that right. has a lot of color? How can you make that more right. nutritionally loaded meal? So then you can be like, you know what? Boom, there it is. Yeah. So that's really what I try to yeah. show people. I was just curious if you, I was getting at, if you have any controversial posts, like that you didn't consider controversial when you put them out there, but that you got a lot, because moms are very, some moms are very particular, or dads, um, about what their kids eat. What's given the most, I guess, um, you know, commentary, because there was a controversial, you didn't think it was controversial, but it came out, there was a lot of... Do we have one? Talk about that. (laughs) Oh my gosh, yes. Yeah, okay, yeah. I knew there'd be one or two, yeah. What is it? I heard my assistant laugh and I was like, okay, that's right. Yeah, what is um, it? So you mentioned that pancakes are really popular um, because it's really not complicated to make pancakes, okay? They come um, in the box. You just yeah. – It's easy from the box but yeah. not from the box. Is we The thing about it is like we already have the ingredients. Why buy the box? You, everybody yeah. has flour. That's you true. probably have baking powder. You have milk. You have eggs. Like – Beyond that, it's not that complicated. So um, recently, actually, this year for Father's Day, um, I, I decided to make these double chocolate chip pancakes. Sounds and, good so far. Right? Yeah. yeah. And um, I had a lot of backfire. Really? Uh, yeah. Even from loyal readers that had been following me for a long time, they misread that instead of eating cake this Father's Day and making my husband a cake, we were going to celebrate. Celebrate means to me a little indulgency, you know, have a party or whatever. Right. We were going to celebrate a breakfast with these double chocolate, um, double chocolate chip pancakes. Yeah. yeah. And well, that just kind of like went in many directions, as you can imagine. I have a very involved community who hits reply to my weekly emails yeah. all the time, hundreds by the week. And um, and so even loyal readers who have been like, I've been a follower for a long time. I own your cookbooks, blah, blah, blah. I'm so disappointed. And I'm like, why? I'm not telling you to eat chocolate chip pancakes, double chocolate chip pancakes. I'm telling you to celebrate right. with that right. instead of cake. So right, right. that's sort of controversial. It's really 
But I've learned that, you know what, it's really hard to make everyone happy. Yeah. yeah. So you have to be strong enough to just stand there and move forward, man. Some controversy is good. You know, yeah. it gets people involved. So that was controversy, you know, controversial, I guess. You know, you got some pushback, yeah. which is good. Butter in my coffee is controversial. I, don't, see, I guess I'm just used to that. So that doesn't, to me, does not seem controversial because of the Yeah, protein. but, you know, I mean, I get a lot of emails from people who are seeking, um, they want to lose weight. And they want their their they want to get healthier, right. and the entire family needs to lose weight, and they want low fat recipes. But the reality is that low fat doesn't mean right. lose right. weight. It means you know yeah. there's so many other factors in there. And so yeah. Yeah. I always tell people if you're looking for a nutritional label in every recipe, you're at the wrong place. Yeah, you're preaching to the choir here. Yeah, high fat, high protein, good good high fat, high protein. I mean, yeah, um, it's researched. I mean, the paleo diet is. I interviewed Dr. Lauren Cordain, you know, his, he's hundreds of scientifically backed research from his, you know, quote unquote diet. It's more of a lifestyle. Yeah. I don't, I don't totally. like the term diet as much, but, um, yeah. So the content creation side that, and how, where does the, which I think it was very smart. You also have an option. that's a done for you option. People love a done for you option. So tell me about how you incorporated and how that works with the, the done for you. I watched yeah, the video. The it's like, yeah, the delivery. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. How does that work? So last year I realized that, um, you know, clearly a, a Fresh Realm, the par our partner approached me and um, they were like, hey, we really love your brand. We, you know, we like the platform that you've grown and everything else. We'd love to partner with you and create um, done for you meals. And I realized that people will pay a premium to have some done for them options and they were already I mean it's a huge industry already you know there's the blue aprons of the world and the fresh directs and everything else and um, I realized that while most of my audience does make their meals there's always outliers for and sure. there's people that although they make their meals they're going out to eat once or twice a week so that that income that would normally go to going out to eat right. could be spent very much and feel and they, the thing about it is like, I mean, I'm not just in food, I'm in the psychology of food. And so the thing what happens is that they'll go somewhere where it's not as healthy or they'll indulge in something going out and then they don't feel good about the decision that they made. Right, right. And so right. it's like a vicious cycle. And so I want people to feel empowered and feel good about what they put in their bodies. Whether you choose to have it delivered to your doorstep, then we're going to facilitate that. And so for me, that was a no-brainer. Um, it's not one of our, like our, I'll be honest, like it's not our, one of our revenue targets and it's not, yeah. I'm not in all involved in all the logistics. It's more like white labeling, but yeah, I like yeah. offering that premium service to, sure. if you want your stuff delivered, there it is. Um, and there's a lot of people that shop at Whole Foods and they were already buying prepared meals, you know? Um, so that was, um, we launched that really this January. Yeah. So Laura, talk about some of the biggest milestones for the business. Uh, whether it's traffic or revenue, what, where did some of the biggest milestones come in? Um, so some of the biggest milestones definitely, you know, everybody talks about their like their six figure milestone, you know, um, that was really great, really big. Um, for me to be able to hire people full time, you know. You have we, a big team, yeah. We now have a big team. So that was, um, you know, that to me is like a huge milestone. Cause right. In, right. Um, and it's also not only is it a milestone, but it's a huge learning curve and a role change for myself because I went from as being a solopreneur to really being the CEO of my company. So therefore, I now have to step back and delegate. And that was really hard. And that was something that not only is a milestone, but something I had to learn how to do. Um, you know, of course, um, when you get like a your first five figure contract, um, that was huge. For me at the time um what about traffic wise because you get a lot of traffic going to your yeah, site what was so, something that you found worked really well that just completely spiked your traffic um so creating a content cycle is super important um so my milestone you know i remember when i remember when malables hit like 500,000 page views, you know, um, and then we hit 750 and then a million and I was like, oh my gosh. Um, and then that was sort of like a well-oiled machine. And then when my personal site hit like 100,000, 200,000, 500,000, 600, I was like, oh my gosh. 
I, I was like, I really, are people really interested in like the stuff that I share? Like I get like, they see the Mamables brand and they're like, mm-hmm. oh wow, this is like. What do you attribute like, that to? I mean, is it just a slow grind over five years of creating content? Is it like getting on one of the, those shows? What, what do you, you see what? has been the biggest leverage point for you? That you you hit the nail on the head. It mm-hmm. is a continuous. You gotta. It's a continuous grind. You have to have to have to promote your content. Like so, you have. To, I people. We're so focused on creating new things that we forget that our old things is always new to someone who's never been. Right. Right. So therefore, really creating a cycle of a content cycle for the stuff that's really great. Um, is super important, um, and that's really what I attribute it. We have a terrific content cycle. Um, nothing is old. Every to me is like I see it. Everything's new. It's new to somebody, right? right? Um, and some of our best things are the things we wrote a year or two ago. So sometimes we're like, yeah, but it's old. No, it's not old. Just take new pictures, upgrade, uh, update the graphics or the logo. You know, and I realize not everybody that's listening is yeah. into food. But you, there's so many things that you can do. So you're updating old posts and then promoting old posts again. Yeah, create yeah. a series of uh, create a new post with three of your better ones that link out. Um, so that's really the things that have really contributed to that big milestone of like million yeah. visitors plus and such things. Yeah, like you, I mean, we talked to the whole time. There's a lot of moving parts to running the business. What's been some of the biggest challenges for you? Honestly, like I just had this conversation this morning and yeah. I'm really, really hard on myself and my biggest challenge is to accept that I'm already doing great things. So, and that's hard because like... You want to be you know, further along always. I, you always saying. want to be further along than where you are today. And so, you ha- and, you, and if you want to do that, you honestly have to look at yourself really critically. So, um, for me, video has been... a huge challenge I've had no camera experience um, prior to like I literally went f- fresh off the boat to Food Network and <laughs> I I look back at that Food Network video and I'm like oh my gosh I could have done so much better but you can't do that right you what you, you can start somewhere is look forward and say well what can I change you know like what are the things that makes me look awkward like what can I learn um, and so, and even looking at my own YouTube channel, like I look at my earlier videos and people are like, oh, they look at my video that I put out yesterday and they're like, you're a natural. And I'm like, yeah, but you say After that now. After a but you thousand know. videos, right? <laughs> right. And so you get better, you know, you, you just, um, I think if you stick with it, the key that most people have is that they don't stick with things long enough to become really good at it. Yeah. So it's really about the art of mastering something, right? Yeah. Um, but you don't have to master everything about your business, which is something that I think a lot of entrepreneurs um, they 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 don't ha- they don't give themselves the opportunity at mastering like three things that they're really great at because we focus on mastering so many aspects of our business. Right. So I've learned to delegate the things that I'm not that I understand but not really great at. Yeah. Like project management, my Stephanie's phenomenal with that. Yeah. You know, there's social media. Like, there, I, my my husband with like, you know, Infusionsoft or virtual assistant with that. I understand all those elements. I'm just really not that. It, if I took on all of that, I wouldn't spend time. I, I write all my scripts. I do all the production for video. So I wouldn't really because video is where I want to go. Right. So otherwise, I wouldn't be focused on growing that part and getting better at it. Yeah. You know, since this inspired insider, Laura, I always ask, what's been the lowest point? And then how you push through? Um, Because it wasn't always five figure contracts with, you know, big brands. uh, Literally, I've had a lot of lowest points, and they've all, nearly all of them involved um, my cookbooks. Really? Um, It's super stressful to get these recipes typed out, and literally, I've gotten almost physically sick uh, deadlines you know um like my lowest points of all which is why when i tell people three and i'm good like it's like kids I, right your kids I are like your cookbooks i know that this is my last cookbook right, right? right i just know that i know really okay um because um i don't want to physically experience that ever again what is it um, about it that stresses you out so much 
Because people, I mean, have that cookbook. Like for you, it's a cookbook. For other people, it's something else in their business that just makes them physically sick. What do you think it is? I honestly think it's not, at the end of the day, it's not what you should be doing, mm. right? So um, it's great and they're beautiful, and, um, but it's really not where my, my talent really is. So when I look at what I enjoy doing the most, that would be producing video, video production, and in turn that actually you know, it's really a full cycle and that brings in revenue for the company, brings in new leads for Momables, it brings new contracts, television opportunities, like a lot of different things. And that's because I focused on what I'm best at. Yeah. But I didn't know that until I tried it, you know, so. You knew that that was not where your time should be spent. Yeah, I definitely know that cookbooks is not where my time should be spent um, for sure. Talk about early on though. Was there you know right now, like you say, it's been five you know five years before you see a lot of traction or four years. Yeah. What about early on, like where you thought, I and mean, what kept you going when maybe the traffic wasn't at a million page views a month? Right, right. I mean, what were you seeing early on that you're like it's discouraging? Oh, talk sure. about one of those discouraging early moments. Yeah, so I mean, let's just talk about meal plan development, okay? Creating meal plans. Um, I, I should let you guys know that since you're listening and watching that I'm still creating the meal plans at this moment. And I, I found that super stressful. And um, because I, for a period of time, I had a meal plan developer in place, and she really wasn't the quality. I, I think I might have mentioned, but I'm slightly a perfectionist, and I know exactly what my audience wants and likes and I failed at training this person mm. to meet that and therefore the quality of my meal plans went down for about uh, nine to, for about a period of a year which reduced our revenue significantly about 50 percent really yes wow. and so the biggest mistake and and that I've made is letting go something that's super crucial to the revenue of our company or letting it go to the point of like not supervising it enough you know um, so right now, I've been developing meal plans since last uh, February, I think, February or March, and that's been super, super stressful. So even early and early on, um, I, when I still, now I'm doing them now and I did them then, um, early on, they were kind of stressful, but um, I, it was hard for me to, like, man, these are really great, why don't people buy them? But then... I didn't know what I know now about marketing and cycling. I didn't have the traffic and the hardest part is just sticking to it. And I just, the thing is, is like I knew that what I was doing made a difference. And so I hung on to that one email that came once a week from one person that said, oh, I just want to tell you that my son hasn't eaten spinach in, in like 10 years. And I made this like yeah. these kale tacos or whatever it was. And he ate, and I, I just want to thank you. Yeah. And so I hung on to the things. I still have a folder in this one in, the, in our info email inbox, you know, that's called gratitude. And they are yeah. to read. It used to be called to read when you're down. And I every time I got one of those emails, I put them in that folder. And I have emails from 2012 in there. And I read yeah. them when I'm down. So that's what kept me going, knowing that what I was doing made a difference. So we should all have a to read when you're down folder. You should. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, you should also have an a-hole folder and never read those. Uh, so, um, because you get, as you grow, you get those too. Especially um, when you put out recipes for double chocolate chip pancakes and you'll get... You bet. Yeah. Um, but it's very hard to put yourself out there on the internet. And I think that's... A, a, a lot of people that create web websites and companies on the internet, they are, we're, um, and, and mo a lot of people, a lot of bloggers, a lot of content creators are introverts. And so the time, the, then, then they hire a business coach and tells them, hey, you need to put yourself out there a little bit more and so people can relate to you. And they're going, wait a minute. I like being behind the screen. Right, right. right. Um, and so it's kind of, it's hard to put yourself out there. And when you do, you have to expect people to not like you. Yeah, and you know yeah. what? It's totally okay if people don't like yeah, you. Yeah. So, Laura, on the flip side, uh, being physically ill from putting out books, what's been the proudest, one of the proudest moments? 
Um, well, recently, one of the proudest moments, I don't go on Facebook too much. Um, my personal face, like, you know, my personal Facebook page. Uh, but my proudest moment is to be able to say that my husband quit his job. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was a proud moment for me, but also in the same post, you know, because I realized that I couldn't have done this. I couldn't have given him the opportunity had he not supported us and, and provided for us sure, sure. for, you know, the last decade, really. Um, we've been married 13 years this fall. So nice. um, it's really not about me, but it's about what he has also done sure. to put himself in that situation. So that was really one of my proudest moments. I love that. Yeah. Um, mentors. Another piece of the puzzle is mentors. Who are influential mentors that you go to or it's a colleague to bounce things off from a business perspective that's not in your business? Uh, I forgot to even thank Justin Crane for in, for introducing us. Yes. Um, I love Justin and I know you know Justin well also. So thank you, Justin. Yes, yeah. he introduced us. Um, one of my mentors, uh, her name is Melissa Lance. She is how I met Justin. Um, Justin works uh, with Melissa and Melissa owns a company called The Fresh 20 which is uh, meal planning for dinner only and she's highly successful and so while we don't spend you know we don't have an hour call every month you know nothing like that um, I do know that if I reach out she does make time to help me um, and has helped me she was instrumental when I first launched uh, and I met her at a conference, super random. And um, and if you ask her why she stuck with me and helped me, it's because she said that, and she told somebody, I heard her say that when I introduced myself to her, I didn't say I'm thinking of doing this. She's, I said, this is what I'm going to do and this is how I'm going to do it. Right. Could you please answer these three questions for me? Yeah, you're serious. And so yeah. we became friends after that. Um, so she's been instrumental. I um, I read a lot of social media stuff online. Um, I am friends with somebody called named Derek Halpern of Social yeah, Triggers. Yeah, I read his uh, his blog post about you because <laughs> so, he talked about you and then your success and then the Marie Forleo program also. Yeah, so this is like four, three or four years ago, but um, we met and I just went to New York, had you know two hour coffee with him, and just kind of. Re- and I, what's really cool is that at some point you you kind of see not financially equals, but you can see that in the industry you're sort of equals, and that's really an awesome moment, you know, um, to know that you're there with the people that you've looked up to. Um, I have an MBA and I worked in the business industry. We've been business school mentors for five years at Loyola University in New Orleans. And I will tell you that business schools and MBA programs are not preparing people to run online businesses. And more so, things are not even necessary. So you have to really, um, so I did do B-School by Marie Forleo uh, really early on. And that was kind of instrumental to kind of I would say mental positioning of what I was doing. Yeah. Um, you know, I've learned how to write copy online, things like that. So, but on a day to day basis, like I literally shoot things back and forth uh, with my husband. Yeah. Um, and my dad, my stepdad, like he's a retired, he's in the uh, PR, he was in the PR industry for years, but he's really, really good about telling me. How, whether or not my I, my great ideas are really on brand or not. Right. So, um, yeah, so my dad is yeah. another one. But really, industry-wise, you know, that's about yeah. it. Yeah. Laura, thank you so much. This has been hugely valuable. I appreciate it. Um, so everyone that's should fun. check out mamables.com and laurafuentes.com. It's F-U-N-T-E-S.com. Um, last question, Laura, for yeah. you. So tell me about one of the When You're Down folder messages what what sticks out to you is one of your favorites oh my gosh you know what there was one a couple of years back that um you know we a lot of parents come to me with their picky eaters and this woman thought she was 
being she she was very very hard on her son because he she she thought that he was a picky eater and he didn't want to try food so they had like battles on the table like it wasn't really meal time wasn't bringing the best out of her and she had read um or you know maybe listened to a podcast of mine where I where I interviewed an a picky eater expert and I shared my story about you know that I was one of those moms who really not force fed my kids, but really got into it with my kids about not eating and blah, blah, blah. And then I realized that my son had a clinical issue. Mm -hmm. So it really wasn't about me. And um, when you shift that, so she was listening to the podcast and took her son to a specialist. And indeed, he had a clinical issue. They've spent six months working through it. And it wasn't the food. It was you know, something clinically wrong. And so she just, I mean, it was the nicest, longest email that, and I was like, you know what, that's how I tell you, like, I, I, the littlest things, you make a difference. And it's not making a difference. I don't need to make a difference to a million people. Like, I made a difference in that woman's life and her yeah. son's life. Yeah. So that's one of those really good ones. Yeah. Laura, thank you so much. Thank you. I really appreciate it. It's been awesome. My pleasure. Thank you. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See, life's like a beach If you find the sand right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand